Hello and welcome to the ICS 103 programming course. This is the 11th lecture. We're going to be talking and covering the recursive functions. So let's start. <coughs> so this is the outline of what we're going to cover. We're going to cover recursive functions and recursion. Uh, how to write a recursive function, recursion versus repetition, tracking a recursive function and examples, mutually recursive functions and common errors in recursive functions. Okay, so this is basically what's going to be covered in this lecture. So let's start with what is a recursive function. Okay, so basically a recursive function is a function that calls itself. So any function call itself again and again is called a recursive function. Okay. So it can call itself either directly or indirectly. So you can call another function that calls it, or it can call itself directly. And in this, any function that does this is called a recursive function. In C, any function can call itself. Okay, so C allows you to do that. There is no stopping in C and calling the same function. Okay, so the function calls itself again. So this is an example. What will be the output of the following program? We have the main, and in it we want to print going around, and then we call the main again. So when we start the main, we go going around, we're going to print going around to the screen, then we call the main again, then we come up print going around, and go to the main and call another function, going around and call again and again and again and again. So this is actually a recursive function, which is a very bad recursive function because it has an infinite loop. It's never going to get out of the recursion, okay? So it's calling itself itself, and it never is going to reach the end of the program. Whenever it tries to reach the end, it's going to call itself, so it's going to go around, and you'll have your screen going around, you print, uh, you'll have on your screen printing going around, going around, going around, going around, going around, going around, going around until the computer crashes and runs out of memory, okay? So this is a recursive function. So simply a recursive function again is a function that calls itself, okay? Recursion is a very powerful problem solving technique, okay? It's a very powerful tool that you can learn and you can solve complex problems and you'll have one very complex problem at the end and you would, <coughs> and you would see that we can actually solve it in a few lines of code using recursion. Many mathematical functions can be defined recursively. An example of a recursion is 5 factorial, okay? The factorial function. If we have 5 factorial, we can actually write the 5 factorial close to 5, multiply by 4, multiply by 3, multiply by 2, multiply by 1. Everybody knows that. Anybody who knows mathematics and knows the factorial knows that 5 factorial is 5 multiplied by 4, multiplied by 3, multiplied by 2, multiplied by 1. Okay? Or equivalently, 5 factorial is 5 multiplied by 4 factorial. Okay? And by definition, we have 0 factorial is equal to 1. Okay? So in general, you can say n factorial is equal to 1 if n is equal to 0. Otherwise, it's n multiplied by n minus 1 factorial, okay? And this is called the recursion. So you're calling, so n factorial is calling the factorial function again, but we're dealing with a degree lower problem. We're going from degree of n to n minus 1, okay? By reapplying the recursive case solution, we'll move closer and closer and reach the base case, okay? So there are two things. This is called, okay, so this is called the base case, it's written over here, and this is called the recursive case, okay? In a recursive function, it's very important that you should reach the base case, otherwise your recursion is not going to stop. If you don't reach your base case, your recursive function will go to infinity, okay? Or until the computer actually crashes, either it's outside of memory or it actually burns itself. So a recursive function is a function that has a base case. So you have to think of a base case and you have to think of the recursion by itself. Okay. So how do you write the code of a recursive function? So this is how you write it. You say if you have reached the base case, solve the base case, which is easier to solve, else redefine the problem using recursion. Okay. Now let's come back with the example over here of 5 factorial. Okay. So as we have seen, 5 factorial is nothing but 5 multiplied by 4 factorial, okay? Now, 5 factorial is a quite complex problem for most of us, okay? We cannot think of what is 5 factorial directly. So what we do is we say it's equal to 5 multiplied by 4 factorial, okay? So 4 factorial is another complex problem, but it is one degree lower than 5 factorial, okay? So we're actually lowering the degree of the problem or the complexity of the problem by some number in the recursive case. 
Then when we try to solve four factorial, we cannot. So we say this is equivalent to five multiplied by four multiplied by three factorial, okay? So three factorial over here is a factorial which is one degree lower than four factorial, which is actually two degree lower from five factorial. Although that three factorial is not that hard to compute, but I'm gonna assume over here that it still is hard to compute. So I'm gonna say five multiplied by four multiplied by three multiplied by two factorial. Now two factorial is one degree less than three factorial, two degrees less than four factorial, three degrees less than five factorial, okay? In complexity, this is less complex, okay? And then two factorial is quite easy to calculate. Uh, if you don't know it, you have to go to 5 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 1 factorial. 1 factorial is again 1 multiplied by 0 factorial and by definition 0 factorial is 1. Okay, so you can come over here and write this 5 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 1 multiplied by 0 factorial. And by definition, this is 5 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 1 multiplied by definition 0 factorial is 1. And then you have to go back and start doing the substitution in. 1 multiplied by 1 is 1. Then you have to multiply it by 2 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 5. This is equal to 5 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 2 2 multiplied by 1 which is equal to 5 multiplied by 4 multiplied 3 times 2 is 6 which is equal to 5 multiplied by 4 times 6 is 24 okay and then you can actually calculate the 5 factorial which is actually going 5 multiplied by 24 120 okay so this is how you calculate the factorial Okay, so you can see we started from 5 factorial and we started a phase called the expansion phase and then we go back to a substitution phase, okay? And this is how you solve it. So you want to think, when you're thinking recursively, you want to think of a problem and break it to another problem which is a degree lower than the degree of the problem. So this is a degree lower than this problem. This is very easy, five multiplied by a number. This is a degree lower than this. Then you break this problem into a degree lower, and then this problem into degree lower, and you break it, this is called expansion. This is substitution. Substitution. Okay, then when you have completely solved it to the basic operations, then you start doing the substitution and you come back, okay? So, coming back over here, recursive functions generally involve an if statement, okay? So there is an if statement, and in the if statement, you put the base case or what is known by fact, just like zero factorial is equal to one. So if you have reached your one, you solve the case, you return one, otherwise you redefine the problem using recursion. The if branch is the base case, so the if is the base case, while the else is the recursive case, okay? Very important. If is the base case, the else is the recursive case. The recursive case provides the repetition needed for the solution and the base case provides the termination. So when you come over here, you always go to the repetition case, which is the, uh, which is not the base case. And then when you reach the base case, you're gonna terminate it over here and the base case is gonna terminate it for you. Well, since just like the example, the base case of zero factorial, so you're gonna start to terminate over here your factorial problem because you know the solution and you return the value otherwise you're going to be redefining it as a recursion okay so if you wanted to do a factorial and a recursive way what would you have to do so int factorial int n so you're going to take a variable n as your input and then you can say if n is equal equal to zero return one why because zero factorial is one else return n multiplied by factorial n minus one okay so this is a recursion case, okay? And in the recursion case, what's gonna happen is you're gonna define the problem. So you had n factorial that you had to calculate. Now you have to calculate n minus one factorial. See, the degree lower factorial, calling the function factorial with a degree lower problem, okay? This is the recursive case, and you can have it in an iterative case. And in the iterative case, you're gonna define i and product equal to one, y product equals one, because multiplication identity is one. So you're gonna initialize product by one. And you say for i equals to n, i greater than one minus minus i, product is equal to product multiplied by i. 
So we're going to multiply n, then n, I'm going to n minus 1, then n minus 2, and n minus 3. So you're going to put n, n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3 until you reach your i equals to 1, and you're going to load out and you're going to print the product. This is the recursive function that is doing exactly what's done in the iterative function. Over here, you start with n, so suppose you start with 5, so this condition is not going to be true. So you're going to come over here, say 5 multiplied by 4 factorial, and you're going to call the function 4 factorial. 4 factorial is going to come over here again, and 4 factorial, 4 is not going to be 0, so you're going to go 4 multiplied by 3 factorial, and you're going to go on and on and on and on until you solve this problem. Okay? So, we talked about the expansion phase, and we talked about the substitution phase. So suppose we have factorial 4. Factorial 4 is equal to 4 multiplied by factorial of 3. But factorial 3 is nothing but 3 multiplied by factorial 2. 2 is nothing but 2 factorial is nothing but 2 multiplied by factorial of 1. Factorial 1 is nothing but 1 multiplied by factorial 0. And factorial 0 is nothing but 1, okay, by definition. Okay? And then we'll start the substitution phase. Okay? So this is the factorial and how you actually can see it. Now if you want to see what happens in a recursive function, here is the same example for factorial equals to 4. What you're going to say is, when you start your program, you'll be allocated a memory for a factorial. And in it, n will have the value 4. Okay? So when you call this function, n4, you're going to check this condition. This condition is not going to go true. So you're going to come over here and you have to return n, which is Four, you have to return over here. What do I have to return? Four multiplied by the factorial of n minus one. So I need a number over here. Okay? And this is a function call, and in the order of precedence, I have to do the function call first. So I call the function factorial again. Okay? And inside it will be the value of n. This is n minus one, so over here I pass it three. Correct? And I have to return over here. What do I have to return? I have to return 3 multiplied by some number, which is factorial of n minus 1. And factorial of n minus 1 is going to instantiate another memory of factorial. This is another memory, n. And I'm going to pass to it 2. Correct? So I'm going to pass to it 2 because I want to pass to it n minus 1. So n is 3. Now I am going to go and return. What do I have to return from here? I have to return 2 multiplied by something. And what is the something? Factorial of 1. So I call the function factorial again. And n is over here 1. And what do I have to return? I have to return 1 multiplied by something. And what is that something? It's the factorial of n is equal to 0. Okay? So let's go from it again. So factorial of 4, when I call factorial integer n is equal to 4, okay? So I have factorial integer n is equal to 4. I have a memory initiated to me, and I have n is equal to 4. And I come to this condition, this is not true. So I come over here, I have to say 4 multiplied by, so I have to return 4 multiplied by factorial of n minus 1. But this is a function call, so I have to call this function first. So I instantiate a memory, and I call the function. And in it, I have n is equal to 3. Okay, because n minus 1, this was 4, so n minus 1 is 3, so I put my n equal to 3 over here. And in this one, I come over here and check this. Is n 3 is equal, equal to 0? No. So I go over here, return 3, multiply by factorial of n minus 1. So I have to go calculate n minus 1, factorial n minus 1. And my n was 3, so I'm going to go factorial of 2. So I'm going to go initiate another memory. We have n equal to 2, and I'm going to calculate in it factorial of 2. And in it, I say, is 2 equal equal 0? No. I come over here, return n. It's just 2 multiplied by factorial of 1. So I have to instantiate another memory, calling factorial 1, and n is equal to 1 over here, and when I come to it, is 1 equal equal to 0? No, so I have to return 1 multiplied factorial of n minus 1, which is 1 minus 1, which is 0, so I have factorial of 0. When I come to 0, I have to return, as this condition becomes true, because n is equal to 0, you can see n is 0 is here, I return 1, so from here I have to return 1. So now I have to multiply 1 by what is over here, because now factorial 0 returned this. Now when this was n, I had 1 multiplied by factorial n minus 1. So factorial n minus 1 is 1 multiplied by 1. I'm going to return 1. Then I'm going to come over here. 2 multiplied by 1. I'm going to return 2. Because when n was 2, I had to 2 multiply by factorial of 1. Factorial of 1 gave me the result of 1. 
Factorial of 2 gave me the result of 2. And in, in factorial n equals to 3, I had to return 3 multiplied by factorial 2, which is 2. So 3 by 2 is 6. And then I returned 4 factorial. So 4 multiplied by 6, I have to return over here 24. So this function was going to return 24. So you see how the expansion occurs. And then the substitution comes in. So this is the expansion phase. And the substitution phase, when you have reached the base case, so you're going to come back here. So this member is going to be deleted. Then you do the multiplication. Then this member is going to be deleted. Then you do the multiplication. Then this member is going to be deleted. Then you do the multiplication. This member is deleted. Then you do the multiplication. This member is deleted. And you come out 4. So you calculate your factorial of 4. Okay. So this is the expansion and the substitution phase. Another visualization of the expansion and substitution phase is this way, but that is uh, the first the example that I showed you over here. This is a memory expansion and memory uh, substitution, whereas this is the expansion, mathematical expansion, and mathematical substitution. Okay, so you can see how the recursive function actually works. Now we come to a multiplication. We want to write a recursive function to compute m multiplied by n where both m and m, m and n are integer variables. Okay, this is m and n. This is, uh, these are two variables, not the chocolate that you eat, but these are variables in C, okay? So don't mix and match. So you want to write a recursive function that can actually compute m multiplied by n. Okay, so the best way to go about this is to identify the base case and recursive case. Okay, so what is m multiplied by n? So I want you to think of this as a recursive function. m multiplied by n, I want you to think of it in a problem that you can actually reduce the problem by 1 and have a less complex problem. Okay, so if you think of this, you have a base case if n is equal to 1, correct? If n is equal to 1, that is the base case. Anything multiplied by 1 will give you this, the thing itself. So m multiplied by 1 will be m. Okay. What is the recursive case? So m multiplied by n is nothing but m plus m multiplied by n minus 1. Okay. That is clear because m multiplied by n is you have to add m n times or you can say m plus m multiplied by n minus 1. Okay. Which is equivalent to m multiplied by n. So you can write m multiplied by n as m if n is equal to 1. Otherwise, it's equal to m plus m multiplied by n minus 1. And then you can code this very easily in C. So where is the multiply function? This is the multiply function. So the multiply function, you say if my n, which is the value that's passed to me, is equal equal to 1, I want to return m. Else, I return m uh, plus the function that I'm calling over here, the multiply, m and n minus 1. Okay, m multiplied by n minus 1. So I have to multiply m and n minus 1. So this is a simple case of a recursive function. Okay, so here is how the full example actually goes. You have your directives, hash and pull this to the edge, and then you have your int multiply int m and int n. This is the prototype of my function, and the main function, we're going to define two variables, num1 and num2, and we're going to ask the user to enter for us two numbers, and we're going to read them and put them in num1 and num2 using this kind of function. Then we're going to print the numbers before multiplying, okay? And then we're going to print them after multi before multiplying, we're going to print the numbers, and after multiplying, we're going to print the number. We're using the function multiply num1 and num2. So we pass num1 to num2 of multiply, so we have m and n. So num1 will be in m, and num2 will be in n. And we say if n is equal to 1, return for me m. Otherwise, return for me m plus multiply m and n minus 1. And this is the recursive case. So I'm going to make, if the m comes with, let's say, 5 multiplied by 2, this is not true. So I come over here, return 5 multiplied by 5 and 1. Okay? So if we multiply 5 by 1, so we're going to come over here and return the 1. We turn the m, so 5. So it's going to go 5 plus 5, which is 10, is going to be returned by the multiply. And we have our recursive case, which is solving our problem. Okay? So recursion is a very, very powerful technique. And here is the example. We have multiply 5 and 4. So you have 5 plus multiply 5 and 3. And then you have, this is multiply 5 and 3 is nothing but 5 plus multiply 5 and 2. Multiply 5 and 2 is nothing but 5 multiply 5 and 1. Multiply 5 and 1, we know anything multiplied by 1 is the same thing, so we'll return 5. 
So we have 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5. So we do this substitution and we add these two together first, the inner we get 10, we add 5 and 10, we get 15, we add this, we get 20, and that's the substitution phase, okay? So recursion is quite easy. You just have to have a different method of thinking and try to think of the problem in, a, in another way that you could actually lower the degree of problem by one and try to reach a base case, okay? So think of a base case and then think how you can go from your case to the base case and hit the base case. Okay, so suppose we wish to define our own power function that raises a double number to a power of a non-negative integer exponent, so x to the power of n, when n where n is greater than or equal to 0. The base case if, if n is equal to 0. If n is equal to 0, everybody knows anything to the power of 0 is 1. Okay, so this is the result. And the recursive case is x to the n is equal to x multiplied by x to the power of n minus 1. Okay, so this is actually it. And if I go and keep on doing the recursion, the n minus 1 will eventually reach 0 because my n is greater or equal to 0. So it's eventually going to reach to 0 and I'm going to stop my recursion and return 1. So x of n is equal to 1 if n is equal to 0 or x of n equals to x multiplied by x multiplied uh, to the power of n minus 1 if n is greater than 0. Okay, and this is the function that actually does that. So this is, you have the double pow, you have x and integer n. So you say if n is equal to 0, return 1. Okay, so anything to the power of 0 is 1. Otherwise, you return x multiply by pow x and n minus 1. Okay, so instead of n, you're passing n minus 1. And doing the recursion, you're going to come back to the base case. And the base case is then going to do substitution. And the substitution is going to uh, give you the answer of your multiplication. Okay, so this is a recursive function for multiplication. Now here is a bit more tough example, which is the Fibonacci sequence, okay? So suppose we wish to define a function to compute the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence is a sequence of numbers that begins with zero and one, okay? So it always begins with zero and one and has the property that each succeeding term is the sum of the two preceding terms, okay? So the Fibonacci sequence starts with zero and one. This term is equal to this plus this, okay? So you get one, zero plus one, you get one. 2 is actually the sum of these two, okay? So 1 plus 1 equals to 2. Then you have the next term is the sum of these two. 1 and 2 is 3. Then the next term, which is 2, multiply, 2 plus 5, 2 plus 3, which is 5. Then the next term is 3 plus 5, which is 8. Then the next term is 5 plus 8, which is 13. Then the next term is 8 plus 13, which is 21. Then the next term is 13 plus 21, which is 34. And the sequence goes on till infinity. Okay, so when we say the nth term, so let's say the fifth term, so this is 0, 1, 2, 3, oh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5th, this is the fifth term. If you say the seventh term, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th, this is number 8, okay? So this is the Fibonacci sequence. So, so Fib n, uh, the Fibonacci sequence has a short of Fib, okay? Mathematically, the sequence Fib of n is equal to n if n is equal to 0 or 1, so, okay? So if, if n is equal to 0, it will be 0. If it's 1, it will be 1 and it's equal to fib of n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2. So if you want to take the Fibonacci of this, you have to calculate this and this, and this is nothing but the Fibonacci of this and this, and you go on, okay? So how do we write the recursive function for this? It's a very easy function over here. So here is the Fibonacci function. If n is equal equal to 0 or n equals equals to 1, return n, okay? Because these are the two basic terms that we have. Else return Fibonacci of n minus 1 and Fibonacci of n minus 2, okay? So just to clarify, Fibonacci of this is equal to the Fibonacci of this plus the Fibonacci of this. So Fibonacci of this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So Fib 7 is equal to Fib uh, fib 6 plus fib 5. So which is the fib 6? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is fib 6. And this is fib 5. How do you calculate fib 5? You get the fib of this and fib of this. How do you calculate the fib of these? You go on until you reach over here. Okay? So this is the Fibonacci sequence. Now, you know how the code goes and the main function is something very small. Let's take an example of a Fibonacci function, okay? Let's take Fib6. Fib6 is nothing but Fib5 plus Fib4. But Fib5 is Fib3 plus Fib4. 
and fib4 is fib3 plus fib2 and fib3 is fib1 plus fib2 fib1 is by definition 1 fib2 is fib0 and fib1 so 0 and 1 by definition and fib2 over here is fib0 and fib1 0 and 1 okay and fib3 over here you have to do the same thing and fib4 you have to do the same thing so you have to calculate the Fibonacci of the previous sequence so that you can actually proceed so to calculate fib6 imagine how many fibs do you have to calculate you have to add these two together to get fib2 then you have to add these two together to get fib2 then you have to add these two together to get fib3 then the result of this to get fib4 okay and then you have to add these two together to get fib2 then you have to add these two together to give fib3 then you have to add these together to give fib5 this is the first term and then in fib4 you have to add these two together to give fib2 you have to add these two together to give fib3 then you have to add these two together to give fib2 then add these two together to get fib4 then add the result of this with this to get fib6 okay so you see how complex <coughs> excuse me you can see how complex the sequence is going and you really have to use something like a recursive function to do this if you try to do this using a a loop god help you okay well if you use a recursive function this is the code okay very short very small and you can see that this problem if you solve it recursively it really really helps writing the code okay so the Fibonacci sequence is a very good sequence where uh, factorial functions are used and there are many other functions where you can use factorials to actually calculate the data okay so, we have an example here and we want to draw a recursive tree for the call display tree and determine the program output, okay? So here is a program and we'd like to determine its output. Now, in this program we have our main and as soon as it starts it calls a function display3, okay? So display3 is going to go and have a display and n is going to be 3 and it says if n is greater than 0 3 is greater than 0 I come over here and I say print of free up then display n minus 1 okay so if it was start with 3 it will become display n minus 1 it will become 2 then we actually go and do display again and we start doing the code again and again to explain this more I'm gonna be using a small notation and let me yeah let me use it over here so when I have my main function and I'm not gonna draw the memory of the main function because there is nothing in it I'm calling display 3 nothing else but calling display 3 so I have the display function so I have display where I have my n which is 3 okay so if I come over here in this, dis in this display function I have display if n equals to greater than 3 so n is 3 uh, is greater than 0 3 is greater than 0 I print readout so I'll have readout printed out to my user then I have display n minus 1 this is a function call so I have to go allocate another memory name it display okay and inside it n will be how much this is n minus 1 so I had n equal to 3 so I now I'll have n equal to 2 so is n greater than 2 is, is 2 greater than 0? Yes, 2 is greater than 0, so I go over here and print readout. So I have readout printed again for the user. Okay? And then I have display n minus 1. So I have to display again a function. And over here, what's the value of n? I have the value of n to be 1, sorry. Correct? Because it was 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. I'm just going to write 1 like this here. Okay, so the value of n is 1, and I have to come over here, is 1 greater than 0? Yes, so I have to print readout, so this is the third readout that I'm going to print for the user. And then I have display n minus 1, so now my display is again over here. Okay, and the display was going to go and print for me n minus 1, so n over here is going to be 0. So when n is going to be 0, I'm going to come over here, is 0 greater than 0? No, so I'm going to jump over here and I'm going to finish my function, so I'm going to finish the display. Now I have to go back to the display where n was equal to 1 and I was standing over here when I called the n equals to 0. And I have to continue printing so I can print the mum, okay? Then I finish this function, so I go back in this function, I go where the display of n was equal to 2. And I was calling the function display n2, and then I have to print the mum, so I'm going to print the mum, and I'm going to delete this, and I'm going to go back over here and when n is equal to 3, and I have to display this, so this is actually printing the mum again. 
okay? This is how the sequence is going. If this is getting too confusing, come to a simpler display over here. If I have display three, this is called by the function. So I'm gonna come inside here, and since three is greater than zero, I'm gonna print react. Then I'm gonna call display two, correct? So n minus one, display two. And inside display two, since two is greater than zero, I'm gonna print react. Then I'm gonna call display one. So display one is gonna go, and since one is greater than zero, I'm gonna print react. And then I'm gonna call display zero. Display zero is gonna call over here, since this is not true, If and, and zero is not greater than zero, I'm gonna come over here, it's not gonna print anything, come back to display zero, and then continue, okay? So eventually what I did over here is come and print the mom, and then I'm gonna go back over here, display one, I'm gonna print the mom, then I'm gonna go back over here, display two, I'm gonna print the mom, then I'm gonna back to display three, and come to my stop of my program, okay? So you see how you do the recursive function is actually as if as you are expanding this code and typing the same code again and again inside over here, okay? So this is a recursive function, another example of recursive function, and this is a good tree that you can actually draw. So this is the sequence of the program. You have to print readout, call a function, print the mom. So the first time you call the function display, you have to print readout, dis call display two, and print the mom. But in display two, you have to print readout, call display one, print the mom. Then, but in display one, you have to call readout, uh, print Riyadh, call display zero and print the map. In display zero, you have to do nothing. So you print Riyadh, 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 print nothing over here, the mom, the mom, the mom, and you come back to your function. Okay, so this is a very good tree where you can actually use it to track how your uh, recursive function is working. Okay, here is another example. Suppose that we want to make a trigonomatic function and we'd like to define the sine, the cosine, and the tan x, okay? So, sine x is defined to be sine of x over three multiplied by three minus tan square x over three divided by one plus tan square x over three. Okay? Okay, so this is the definition of sine x. For very small values of x, for very, very small values of x, this sine x is equal to, is approximately equal to x minus x cubed divided by 6. This is a 6, not a 3, not an x, okay? So sine x is equal to x minus x cubed divided by 6, okay? So for very, very small angles, if you have a very small angle, and a very small angle could be something like 0.00000001, okay? Then sine of x is almost equal to x minus x cubed to the divided by 6, okay? x to the power of 3 divided by 6. And then tan of x is nothing but sine x over cosine x, and cosine x is nothing but the square root of 1 minus sine x. Now, if you want to write a sine function, this will become your base case, okay? So you say, if x is less than the very small value of the angle, return x minus x cubed divided by 6. So this is x cubed divided by 6, and this is x. This is the value of your sine x. Otherwise, if the value was bigger than this, you declare a double y is equal to tan x over y. So you call a function tan, and the tan is nothing but the sine x over cosine x. And you return sine x over three, and this is the, what you return, x over three, multiplied by three minus y squared divided by one plus y squared. Now you call the, fine, you call the sine x over three. Now notice, if you come up with an angle of, let's say, 90 degrees over here, this condition will not be f true, so it will be false. So you go over here and you actually calculate tan of x over 3, which is a smaller angle than the 90 degree that you are actually asking. And then you calculate the sine, so this is a recursive function, sine, which is x over 3. So if you start with 90, you're actually sending over here 10. Then when you start with 10, you'll be sending over here uh, 10 over 3, then 10 over 9, then 10 over... Eventually, your angle is going smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, you're going to reach this case. Okay? So you're going to reach this case and you're going to return this value. This is where your cursor is going to stop and then you're going to call back again. For the tan, you're calling sine x and cosine x. Cosine x is nothing but 1 minus square root of the value that was passed to it. And... Uh, so, uh, y is equal to sine x, so you have to calculate sine x for it first. So sine x now again will go over here and it's going to go 
make a smaller value, smaller value, smaller value, so the tan is going to get smaller. So you basically be calling the sine x multiple times uh, to solve this problem. And this is how you can actually write a recursive function for a trigonometric function to calculate the sine and cosine and tan, okay? So uh, the idea is the same. You have a base case. You start with a case and you make it a degree lower. So x over 3 is a, is a degree lower problem than the x. And then you still do recursion. So eventually you're going to hit this small value and calculate the sine based on the base case. Okay? Here is another example. We want to check whether a positive integer is even or odd, okay? So integer is even, int n, if n is equal to equal 0, return 1, else return is odd, n minus 1. And what is the function is odd, n minus 1? So is odd function returns not is even, okay? So very, very simple example over here I'm going to take. I'm going to take the example over here if I have suppose that I have is even I call the function here is even so it's a capital E and let's take an example of 3 okay so if I call the is even 3 function now when I call the is even 3 function everybody knows that 3 is not an even number okay so it's an odd number so this thing should return for us an odd number so let's try to do the recursion over here now, when I call the isEven, I am allocated a memory for isEven function, and inside it I have my n to be equal to 3 because this is the function that called me, correct? Now, what do I have to return here? I have to return back. Now, is n equal to 0? No. I have to return is odd. So I call the function is odd and I give it n minus 1 so n minus 1 is going to be passed to it so 2 I'm going to pass to it so n over here is going to become 2 clear so this is n minus 1 so I had n equal to 3 so I pass 2 to it so this is the is odd function is it so I'm going to return over here not is even not is even is even is a function so I'm going to call is even and over here and the n will be 2 now I check if n is equal to 2 or it's even or not and when I come to the is even I don't know my base case is not reached n is equal to equal 0 this is the only thing that I know because this is the only even thing that I have okay so I say return if, if it's 0 I say return 1 yes it is an even otherwise I return is odd n minus 1 so I go and say is odd and n over here will become 1 and what do I have to return? I have to return not is even. Okay, so I have another call for is even over here. And in this is even, I have my n to be 1. Correct? Then I call to the is even function 1 is not equal to 0. So I have to call the is odd. And I have to put the n to be n minus 1 so this is 0 so when I call to the function I come to the function is even of course I have to return the negation over here and I call the function is even and the is even I have to put my n to be 0 correct when I come back to is even n equals to 0 I have to return a 1 why? Because n is equal to 0, so I have to return a 1. I say, yes, this number is even. Yes. So I come to the is odd, and when I return this, I tell it that, oh, by the way, I have to negate this, so 1 will come 0. So the negation of 1 is 0. Okay? So I'm telling, hey, this is an odd. Okay? And then I come to the is even function, and I return from here, actually. I go here and return the zero okay and then the is odd is going to negate it again is going to become a one so it's is odd is returning not is even and then the is even is returning the same thing that the is odd is returning one then i have to negate it the not is even this is zero so this is going to return for me zero the is even does not change anything in it 
So it actually returned to me zero telling me that number three is not an even number. So what am I doing over here is that whenever I go from an even number to an odd number, so look at this, I went from zero, zero, so I keep it even. And when I go to odd, I change it to, an, I negate it, so it becomes a zero. So when it's an even, I keep it. When I change it, I negate it. Okay, and this is the recursion that we are doing over here. So we start with zero, we know it's even. If we go to one, that means it's an odd. If we go to two, that means it's an even. If we go to three, that means it's an odd. If we go to four, that means it's an even. And this is the sequence that we're trying to do, and this is the recursive function that's trying to do with it, okay? So, you can actually go and draw the recursive tree just like the example before it, okay? I drew for you a different tree. Uh, sorry, this is not the example. This is the example. You can actually draw a tree like this over here and you will come to know exactly what is it that the recursive function is doing or you can go by the example that I have just given you which is actually, I think, is simpler to understand. Okay, now, some common errors writing recursive functions, the functions does not call itself directly or indirectly. So if you write a recursive function that doesn't call itself, it's not a recursive function, okay? So another error that people do, do uh, tend to do is no terminating recursive function. I, that means that you do not, either you don't have a base case, so you have a recursive function and you write it this way, you don't have the if statement and you don't have the base case in it, so this function is going to just go and go and go and go and go, call itself again and again and again until either you are run out of memory or your computer burns out, okay? Or you actually terminate the program. <coughs> the second one, the base case is never reached, okay? So whenever you're planning to go from a number so this is suppose this is a graph and I'm just gonna so suppose this is your base case and you're gonna start somewhere okay either from the positive or from the negative I don't care what you should plan for is when you start from a number that you actually go and hit the base case so you stop the recursion do not make a jump sequence that jumps over and you will keep going on to infinity. You have to come and hit the base case. Make sure that you hit the base case. This is what's mean of a, uh, never reaching the base case, okay? So this is a bad function that doesn't reach a base case. In this example, is if x you want to have factorial and someone comes smart and say, okay, I'll say if x is equal to zero, return one, else return x multiplied by x minus one multiplied by x, another, the, the same, function x minus 2 okay this is a bad example you're jumping 2 so if you start with an even number this is very good you're gonna hit the base case but if you start with the odd number you're never gonna hit the base case which is x is equal equal to 0 you're gonna go from 1 to minus 1 to minus uh, 3 minus 5 minus 7 and you're gonna continue on until infinity or until your PC burns or your memory runs out or you stop your function and uh, or you stop your program and th that's a bad f example because the steps that you have made never re the, all the cases do not reach the base case so make sure that all the cases that you have reach the base cases okay and another error is using local variables okay do not and I repeat do not use local variables and recursive functions why because recursive function as I shown you have different memories okay so just like the example over here all of them have different memories. If you put a local variable over here, if you change a variable over here, it's not going to come change over here because that's local to the web, to the memory that it is in, to the function that it is in, okay? So don't use local variables, otherwise you'll get into a lot of trouble, okay? One of the most common mistakes is that you come uh, some first and positive integers, you declare a local variable and then you actually put the value in it, okay? So that's not right. You have to actually calculate it and do the return and then save the value outside, okay? The correct way is to write it this way. So you don't have local variables. You do not calculate the sum inside the function because you're gonna be actually going from one memory to another, to another, to another. And you will not have access from memory to another because you're not using pointers, okay? And with this, we come to the end of our second, or sorry, uh, to the end of our 11th lecture. I hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you next time in the next lecture. Bye-bye.